All right, everyone. Um, welcome to the series where we talk about uh, 3D printing. This is not necessarily tied to any specific week, um, but it's a sort of reference series of videos to help you understand the process uh, in the case that you will be eventually in the future or for um, your precedent project assignments, be sending files um, to the Fab Lab for 3D printing and what that process now this is the page uh, for now, and um, you can actually, I've linked some of the Fab Lab uh, pages. That kind of gives you the broad overview of, you know, the machines that we have, the build area, which is sort of actually exactly what I've built here. Um, the build chamber sizes, um, the extents that that printer is able to handle in one build. So, Incorp and our object Eden, All right? So this is a really rough um, overview. Uh, second link, actually, these two links are actually pretty helpful, and we'll get into these a little bit. There's the FAQ, especially, you know, um, how do I make sure my model is scaled correctly, water tightness, um, solid geometry, what's an STL. Uh, and you can kind of read through this a little bit on your own, but I will give you a really quick overview first um, so some of these things actually make sense to you. Okay, so download this uh, Rhino file so you have it just exactly like this. And I've said it before in the past uh, during lecture that the first thing you want to do um, if you're preparing something for 3D printing is to scale it down to this size, uh, to the size of the printer because only then will you be able to kind of get a better sense of what the real world thickness is of the things that you're trying to print are um, instead of you know, trying to do some crazy math conversion using the scales um, at you know, the sort of building scale. Now, another really, actually really, really important thing here and I actually think they uh, probably mentioned it on the FAQ somewhere. So two things. One is um, here, right? Be sure to scale a model to real-world size you wish to print, right? Don't bring in a 30-foot model that you want to print at 2 inches, et cetera, et cetera, this sort of stuff. Um, but also under the 3D printing tutorials, you'll see be aware of the model's resolution and tolerance. Uh, we recommend a tolerance of 0 0.001. This means, uh, in practice, is actually this file, which I set up using um, the Rhino template, you know, small uh, small objects inches. Um, if you go to the options and units, you'll see that the model units are inches, and the absolute tolerance here is 0 .001. Um, anything lower than this will sort of uh, result in inaccurate files or inaccurate geometry that has much more basically you'll get more errors um, especially for a really small 3D print so this is really important to check that this uh, worked uh, all intents and purposes we should be probably trying to do is just like import um, it into this file although you would have to basically kind of generally so the 3D printers, or when you're importing Jami, they kind of assume that this is the sort of origin point. So you might want to put these uh, volumes at this point, depending on which com which printer you're using. Okay. Now um, you can look at these if you need some reminder, or just like about what printer does what and what that sort of process is. Uh, these are somewhat of like official, you know. Um, add videos for the respective printers. You can take a look at that. But just to kind of give you a sense of the process, I'm going to do something really quick. So let's do actually do two things. One is the normal box. And this really doesn't matter what size. This is just for demonstration's purpose. And let's make a cylinder. Oops. And let's, uh, we can actually just intuit it. Okay. Now this is uh, Rhino geometry, right? This is NURBS. These are NURBS surfaces, NURBS geometry. Now we said essentially the idea or the concept of uh, exporting um, Rhino geometry, NURBS geometry, 
uh, for 3D printing is you have to go through a process called meshing. So there's a really simple command called mesh, which means to kind of convert Rhino nerve geometry into mesh, select surface, power surfaces, and intrusions. So let's see this. Okay. Now you get this. Uh, there are detailed controls which uh, you will see uh, on the website for the Fab Lab here. Uh, there you can actually click in here and they will give you actually more detailed settings um, on what to pick here if you want to follow these. But uh, just as a basic rule of thumb, you'll see there's a slider, right? So this slider says fewer polygons, more polygons. This kind of just controls how detailed your mesh is and can preview. So one of the main things you'll see, like, essentially it takes uh, your faces and tries to subdivide them into triangles, you know, based on the settings that you give it. Uh, and you'll see, like, if I slide to the right and I preview, then you'll see, okay, so this is how it deals with, generally, with curved geometry. Um, breaks it down into really small surfaces to approximate, right, that perfect circle. So it's not exactly curved, right? Everything is actually broken down to flat faces, just, you know, at a resolution or a scale at which you know, it's really hard for the human eye to notice. This doesn't change at all. So you'll see that, you know, between these two ends, when I click on the preview, if I say OK to this, you'll see that it makes the mesh in the same place. So you'll have your original, in this case, extrusion and the mesh in the same place. So you'll have to actually either move it out or delete uh, the original nerves geometry. So I'll select the mesh, uh, this mesh as well, and I'll turn on my gumball. Move it out. So you'll see, like this is nothing like this, right? And this is kind of due to the like the simple settings. So the simple settings is actually perfect or fine for any geometry that is orthogonal or flat, right? Uh, if the surfaces are planar, there's no curvature to the surfaces, then they're fine. If there's anything that's curved like this, you know, you'll see that I did this. It kind of simplified it into a square. And these surfaces got simplified into that, right? So uh, any geometry that has curvature or has these sort of like uh, circular cutouts, you will want to basically bump up the detail settings for the meshing process. Now another good example um, is if I make a uh, make a plane. Oops. Oh actually no. Okay. And if I make if I draw a rectangle or a couple of rectangles and I draw a circle or two in it, right? And I trim Cutting object, this. Okay. All right. So this, if I try to mesh it, same thing. When you preview, you'll get this. So there's a fair bit of approximation. These are almost exactly. These are generally going to be exactly the same, but the circular curved geometry is going to get some level of approximation by making it to, you know, like whatever, 12, 20-sided you know, circle, um, and that's what it does. So if you bump it up to the other side, then okay. You'll see that the way the mesh is done changes drastically. Um, and a lot of this is basically kind of set on a, um, if you look at the detail controls, it comes from a minimum edge length and a maximum edge length. Um, which basically kind of says that, you know, um, there is a sort of set cadence or the set unit that uh, Rhino will use to subdivide the surface, right? Um, but essentially, like, the more, obviously, the more surf the more uh, sort of mesh faces, the heavier the object, the more data it takes, that sort of thing, okay? So that's the main um, sort of difference, and you'll see that this actually could, you know, it deals a lot better with the sort of, uh, more detailed local geometries, um, and a lot of this is just flat, right? 
So there's a little bit of, you know, and you can kind of play around, right? So you'll see the sort of middle lean ones where it just kind of changes and this, right? So this mesh uh, is always going to be some approximation of your nerve surface uh, to a certain degree, just depending on how much resolution you really need um, for it to represent your model accurately. Okay, so after that, uh, essentially what you do is you select your mesh objects, right? That's that, no, not these, these three. These three mesh objects, uh, you export, you know, export selected, uh, save it somewhere, it doesn't really matter, test. And then you have to change your uh, export type to STL, which is the one that we use for the most part. Um, it's probably gonna go off the page here. Uh, here, so scroll down, STL, stereo lithography. There are options. Uh, generally, you wanna use binary, say okay and say geometry only. If you're only just doing geometry, generally, yes, that's true. Although sometimes, you know, if you have color, then that's different. Save, give you these, say okay. Now, um, I can import that back in just to check. So open, import uh, from my desktop, uh, test, okay, STL model, uh, you generally want to change this to the right sort of import settings. Say okay, okay. And you'll note actually it pops back in in the same exact place, right? So it's actually uh, aware of the sort of relative coordinates um, in the system. So that's why, like, I suggest, like, for example, if we were going to try to print this stuff, that you actually arrange it essentially on the plate or on into the build volume uh, just so you actually know that it's going to fit right so this is actually a good way to kind of check right and arrange things the best you can uh, obviously when you get to the fab lab sometimes they send more than one you know model in the same print so they'll move things around but it's just good to kind of for yourself to kind of uh, arrange things uh, beforehand so you get an idea Okay, so that's the really, really, really simple flag version of the process. However, there is a couple of things um, in this process that you will have to check, and um, we're going to kind of talk about that uh, right now. So one important concept um, that's related to 3D printing is uh, the idea of water type. And you'll see in the FAQ, what do you mean uh, by water type? It means that... Um, there are no open surfaces, and all the models you print uh, have to have a volume. Okay, so if you pour water into it, then you know essentially it would have to hold water or keep out water uh, in the reverse. So the idea of water tightness essentially, like this, is a watertight volume, right? Because it's closed on all six you know directions. It's basically enclosed. When I do a volume check uh, in Rhino, it actually gives me a value, right? So 33 cubic inches, um, something like that. Now, if I explode it, and let's say I deleted the top and the bottoms, right? And I tried to do a volume, then it would say this. Some of those are not close, calculation, blah, blah, blah. You know. And it will try to give you something, but it wouldn't really mean anything, because this is an infinitely thin surface. It has no volume. However, if I, for example, offset surface, this outwards, and it becomes something like that, then this would have a volume, okay? So a big part of preparing your file for printing is actually to look at your geometry, say, what's already a volume, how do I close it, you know, or, you know, are there parts that I need to close or fix? Or what's a simple surface that I need to basically give thickness, right? I need to maybe extrude it, I mean, may, maybe need to offset the surface a little bit, and, and what's the best way of doing that? All right, now there are a couple of things that are related to this idea of water tightness uh, that are relevant. Um, if you go to the site uh, with the 
uh, the Fab Lab site with the 3D printing tutorials, uh, I would suggest you at least read through the first two pages. Uh, the STL file prep in Rhino, which we talked about the tolerances a little bit. And just this idea about there's a concept of uh, what's called naked edges. Um, in particular, a naked edge is basically a situation that would cause a volume to be not watertight. So in this case, you know, if I deleted this guy, join them back together again, you know, this top surface or this top edge is basically a naked edge because it's not connected to anything else. Anything in here, all the edges here are actually connection or a seam basically, right, between two surfaces. This one is not. So there's actually a command uh, called show uh, edges. Okay, show edges. So I can select this. And if I change the edge analysis display, display to naked edges, then you'll actually show me the one naked edge that we know is in this poly surface, right? So when you do analysis on your objects, this is a really easy way to do it. So um, you can close it and just remove the preview. So you can basically sort of like select everything, show edges, and it will also zoom in, right? When you click on the zoom, it will zoom in on that edge or the edges if there's more than one. Uh, the naked edges that it detects. And then you know, okay, I have to fix this somehow. So in the case of this, and I'm just going to close it. In the case of this, I can just simply cap it, right, to close it out. And thus uh, sort of fix any potential problems, seems, you know, where your modeling was imperfect, you know, whatever. Okay, so that's the sort of naked edges. Uh, this is kind of the display. Non-manifold is a little bit um, trickier, but essentially kind of describes a situation where an edge is connected to more than two surfaces, right? So in this case, you see the red lines are the edges that are actually, you know, connecting to six surfaces in total, which, you know, for, in, for the purposes of making a watertight volume does not work very well. So these are called uh, sort of non-manifold uh, edges. And the sort of solution, as you can see here, is to fatten that joint up, whether by sort of doing a Boolean union, like, you know, inserting a circle or a column there, a cylinder there, or as is, is in this case, just like modifying the geometry such that these edges don't happen. Um, you don't have, you know, more than two edges or two surfaces that you know, are share the same seam or share the same edge at any point, right? So that's the only sort of thing. Uh, surface normal direction um, generally should not be a problem for you guys unless you did something really weird, but it's a situation where your surface normals um, are mixed up, like some are facing outward, some are facing inwards, and that can cause a problem. Uh, in particular, you know, if, you know, for example, this, uh, if I look at, if I use the direction uh, command, uh, it shows me, for the most part, um, you know, the faces, all of these are sh basically the sort of surface normal that's on the exterior, it's shooting outwards, um, and there's none that are sort of flipped or, you know, not in line, not incongruent. Um, so it should be fairly rare. But if there is, then, you know, essentially you would have to flip those surfaces. So if I did this, um, right, and then, for example, if I flipped it, then it says you cannot flip a closed solid, right? Because anything that's closed like this should have uh, this sort of situation, okay? Now, while I'm using a poly surface for this as an example, uh, these sort of same things actually apply to the mesh, uh, meshed versions. Um, so if I mesh this and preview it to see what I'm getting, right, um, and I want a little bit more detail, so let's just bump it up, say OK, move it out. Okay, so you'll see this is the mesh, you know, that I'm getting, right. Um, and I'm actually just going to do this intentionally just to kind of show you what uh, what happens, but 
there are mesh edit tools. Um, so I can actually delete mesh faces. So this is a hole, right? I just deleted that one face. And obviously when I select this guy and I say show edges, the naked edges, that's the big hole that I just created and can zoom in. That's the big naked edge. So if you have a hole, a mesh hole like this, um, and you're, you guys probably have not really used this much at all, but there is actually a series of mesh sort of editing and mesh repairing tools here. The obvious one is actually fill hole or fill all holes. Uh, fill all holes kind of goes around and finds or tries to find um, mesh holes and patch them automatically. You can try it. But in this case, we can just say fill hole and just like click on the edge and you'll see that it fills it up. All right. Now, the other thing that we would have to check in this case is just the direction of these faces and say, okay, you know, are they all generally facing in the right direction? You know, that sort of stuff. But this is usually, usually, um, unless you're you're doing something really weird, um, is not an issue um, with the way we generally build things. Okay, so fill holes. Shell model is actually an interesting one because, uh, for example, you know, this we kind of offset surface, right? in the sort of NURBS version of it. Um, we offset the surface to get the thickness and then we uh, meshed it, right? Now, uh, I can still mesh like single surfaces. So like this cylinder surface, cylindrical surface. Um, I can still mesh this. Let's preview it, okay. And you know, you can always go denser if you want denser or less, right? So, okay. Now, if I pull it out, this is the mesh. This is not watertight obvious, right? It's still, it's a mesh surface. It doesn't have volume, et cetera, et cetera. Now there is a command, um, basically that's the mesh equivalent of the offset mesh. So I can actually offset a mesh as well. Enter. And then there's a, there's a sort of different dialog box that kind of gives you a preview. Um, if you want to flip all, basically flips the direction of the offset, right? This, this. Click solid to make it solid. Click both sides to make it offset both sides, right? So it's just it's that. Um, you can change this. So let's do 0 0.5 for example. And I want to go outwards. Solid. Okay, okay, okay. So you actually get a very similar result, right? Uh, between after meshing or just actually um, offsetting the mesh itself. So you can actually, uh, these are some of the options um, that you have uh, in particular. This is actually more useful if you have a really complicated or really messy mesh because offset surface you'll find sometimes doesn't work so well uh, on complex junctions, uh, especially let's say, you know, if, if it is a uh, sort of uh, acute angle. So Something like that, you know, generally. So if I extrude this, uh, not as a solid. Okay, so this sort of surface, if I offset the surface, you know, you'll see it has some weird problems, right? Depending on the settings of kind of out offsetting outwards. Uh, you'll have to like change oh, my corners to sharp, for example. Uh, what's the distance? especially when things start to kind of like self-intersect like this. Um, Rhino 5 has gotten better, but still sometimes like weird stuff will happen. And especially if I try to flip it to go inwards, you know, uh, so this is okay, you know, but you know, sometimes you'll just have problems with this. Um, and so if, if for whatever reason the sort of offset surface method is, doesn't work for you, uh, try offset mesh. Sometimes it'll work better, sometimes it won't. You'll just have to kind of sort of troubleshoot in between these two main methods, okay? Now this method is specifically for open poly surfaces, right? It's really just for this type of thing, um, things that are as sort of described here, are for um, open poly surfaces. 
Um, so you'll get that. Now for closed poly surfaces, you know, something like that, uh, that are volumetric, you'll have to see because sometimes you actually don't want to print a whole solid like this, right? Because it's heavy, it's a waste of money, and that's where you have to look at your model, uh, basically, and say, you know, in some cases, actually, um, if you have something like this, oops, that's a cylinder like this, you don't want to print that, you don't want to waste a lot of money printing the whole cylinder. So what you'll actually have to do is probably like explode it, let's say, delete the bottom, drawing the top back, like you have to decide a way, a direction to hollow out, right? So it usually is the bottom that you want to hollow out because your model is like sitting like this, you don't see the bottom. And then this, then you have to offset the surface. Uh, maybe inwards, the ball, you know, so that it's hollowed out on the inside, right? And the printer doesn't print that whole volume, it just prints the wall thickness, right? So this is the thickness that you're actually giving it. So that's just like something to sort of keep in mind. Now generally you'll find that um, with your design model you basically have two versions, right? You have the version of where it's already a solid and you have to find out a way to hollow it out or clean it out. Or it's an open poly surface like this and you have to find a way to offset it to give a thickness um, for it to be able to, to be printed. Okay. Second concept really, really important is that for things to print or be attached to each other. This, overlapping things like this, is okay. Generally this will print uh, when, when the sort of 3D printing software kind of goes through, uh, it detects the boundaries and says this is actually going to get printed as a whole solid, like together. Um, it's as if they're automatically joined. Now if you have these objects like really close like this, you know, um, if there is a really, really sort of small gap in between them, um, depending on the precision of the printer, this might eventually just fall off. Like it might just fall off after the print. So you have to absolutely make sure at least if there are elements that you want to stick together um, as a whole that they are either overlapping or touching. Now, by touching, uh, I mean sharing a coincident plane. So something like this, Oops. if you are absolutely sure that this is snapping and they are sharing the same planar surface, then that's okay. Uh, this will generally will print together as like one whole thing, object, right? There's not going to be a seam in between them. But if you move this just a tiny little bit apart. I just moved it 0 0.0001 inches apart. And when you zoom in, you kind of see the seam between that. That's going to be a problem. Essentially, that's going to fall apart. So you have to absolutely be sure. And that's where situations were like, uh, in, in particularly in terms of like elements that like uh, turn the corner, um, you actually might want to do, or it's okay to have your geometry do this. Um, it's okay to have your geometry overlap, basically take up this corner um, of the same space. So in, uh, I'll show an example of that in a real, in, right now. So this was a file that was prepared for 3D printing um, off of these sort of original simple surfaces, right? Um, these are single surfaces, and these were the surfaces that were uh, prepared for 3D printing. And you'll see that so there was a the original poly surface that goes around it, and I'll just hide it so it's not in the way. And these are the offset surfaces, and you'll see that just to kind of ensure that the corners merge correctly, that they were done separately, but they overlap like this. Okay. Now you'll have a sort of mixed results uh, nowadays because I actually think the offset surface uh, command has been approved a f improved a fair bit. Now this is offsetting inwards and you'll see that this version, you know, uh, Rhino 5 actually deals with this fairly well. This was actually a model uh, that was done while in Rhino 4.
then Rhino 4 it actually didn't do this this cleanly so this is actually not bad um, in Rhino 4 we had to explode the surfaces and kind of offset them separately which is kind of a pain uh, so this works generally pretty well and then you can mesh it for curved surfaces I generally just like make the mesh settings pretty high and then you will see okay that's the finished mesh that you get that you can export but always it's a good thing to check for volume okay I'm getting a volume I can do show edges see if there are any naked edges no right because when I zoom it doesn't you know zoom me to anything then you can actually be fairly reasonably confident that this is you know this print will survive and will work okay so just remember things you know if you want them to stick together they generally need to touch or overlap overlapping is absolutely fine um, it's okay um, another example of uh, overlapping is this uh, this is the model, the 3D model of the larger 3D print model that I showed you guys in class or in lecture. Um, and you'll see that the joints, actually these are all sort of mesh cylinders, right? But the joints actually are just overlapping. Now, they're only able to kind of stick together because there's enough overlap between them. Um, and also at the joints in particular that all of the sort of geometries including the sort of planar surfaces and the pipes or the mesh pipes um, they overlap enough at the joints that I don't didn't have to go in and basically add you know a joint module uh, otherwise you know one of the things you would want to consider in these sort of situations is to kind of go in at all the node points and place something like a sphere or a box basically a 3D node right to kind of give it enough meat and this is more exaggerated situations like there right where there's only an L but there's just like roughly enough to kind of hold it together now obviously this would not work for a real sort of construction sort of um, situation but for a 3d printed model uh, this is you know fine okay there's a always a certain level of abstraction that goes along with this you also see that this is actually broken up um, into two pieces uh, because the print itself is just too large to actually fit in the build chamber and build volume. So if I uh, came over here, let's say took the Z Corp. So you'll see that essentially this kind of barely fits in the build chamber very close okay while this offset is not absolute because um, I think in this this is a roughly a quarter inch offset you can kind of go past it, it just like depends on how tight you want your tolerances to be but you know something like this would probably be okay um, and as long as you know this is for the Z Corp in particular so you know this is probably how um, I would have sent the print in for this uh, to kind of break it down into two pieces. Now these are kind of rule of thumb things, um, and you'll see like another command you can use is check mesh. We I usually use check volume, and then export it as STL. Um, sort of detailed mesh settings that you can kind of take a look at and then you don't have to do this this is something the fab lab does so this is just like the file preparation side um, and you'll have to kind of interpret your design model um, to be able to say you know what portions of this you know uh, what sort of thicknesses we're really looking at in real life and real size um, that it will print at is it going to be too thin is it going to be too fragile um, especially if there's like really long thin spanning shell structures with no you know sort of boundary beams you know, to kind of support it then you might have a problem now they do kind of give you um, especially uh, they, they kind of give you minimum uh, resolution uh, settings I think somewhere here let me see uh, 
here under the 3D printing fact link, you know, on the bottom, um, how do I make sure my model is scaled correctly? Um, these are sort of like minimum thicknesses generally required by each machine, so an eighth of an inch, a sixteenth of an inch for the object. Um, and you can kind of push it, except that the, this has a really a lot to do with aspect ratio of your elements. And, you know, in this case, you know, how long or how wide each piece is. But if it has walls, then it actually makes it structurally, you know, more solid. So, you know, a sort of tubular structure like this probably would survive. Whereas if it was, if it was, was just like one single piece, um, like this, if it was just this by itself, then it actually might have problems surviving because there's no support around it and it's really thin and long and floppy, right? So a lot of this really is just like kind of common sense. Um, and also a good thing to try sometimes is actually to try to print this out um, on paper uh, to scale because it'll help you actually kind of realize, like plot it out at the size of the, what the model would be. Uh, it will help you realize like what is the real sort of size that you're kind of looking at because you know sometimes it's really hard to visualize these things um, at the size that you're kind of expecting it to be. Okay, so that's more or less it. Um, I'll show you guys some other examples really quick. Um, so these are actually just photos uh, of models or projects that have been have used the 3D printer. Um, in particular, and the laser cutters um, as part of their modeling technique, modeling method. Okay, uh, which can give you pretty nice results. Uh, or actually this one that is a 3D printed but sort of sectional model. So it's actually done in two parts that are split down the middle and does that, right? So you actually kind of model some of the interiors, but also thicken some of the surfaces and the planes, um, essentially to kind of basically let it survive as well. Um, but yeah. And you'll also kind of see uh, essentially how the file was sent, you know, so this is the This is the design model, which is a lot thicker or or a lot heavier because this is all NURBS geometry, right? And then you'll see that generally there's going to be some process of actually converting it, um, or in some time, some cases, you know, remodeling it, re kind of offsetting the surfaces correctly with thicknesses for this to actually go into the 3D printer um, and kind of planning it out, at least in terms of how do I break this thing up, right? And actually this wouldn't have fit in its sort of normal configuration, so actually slicing it into halves, making it into a sectional model was actually kind of necessary um, to be able to actually kind of print it in one whole build, just like this. Okay, that's kind of give you a visual idea of what happens. Uh, this actually, let me import. So this was actually a model, uh, a surface model actually built by uh, Professor Belton. Uh, this is one of his smaller models of a larger uh, sort of material fabric, cast uh, fabric, concrete thing that he did part of research a while ago. Um, but you can also see this is a mesh surface. It's actually a complex mesh surface that you know twists and curls around um, that he built, but then both actually digital and physically eventually. Um, but this was done with an offset surface, it has a volume, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is one of the other examples I showed in class where 
Um, generally, a lot of these interior parts were not really hollowed out, so it was very heavy and expensive. But the sort of uh, amount of detail that you can get, uh, surface detail that you can get, especially these sort of little wiggly parts, right? Um, all these little facets uh, actually print fairly well on the Z Corp, so you can get a lot of this sort of surface articulation on a model uh, like this. Uh, this is another example of a, well, this is kind of more industrial design ish, but this is a sort of uh, room prototype, and these are to hold bristles, but essentially, um, you know, if I do show edges, on this model, it's a very topologically complex model because there's a lot of holes. Um, you can see these sort of surfaces had to have a certain isocurve density to be able to kind of hollow out because it's curved. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of holes in it at the same time. But when I do the knit show edges and show naked edges, you'll see that you, know, you get some really small, weird, um, minute sort of cracks. Uh, usually, and some of these, where like just seems like seams aren't closing properly, especially in the instances where you're going from a flat to a curved surface, that the sort of essentially the detail or the surface density isn't high enough. It seems pretty consistent as to where these things happen, and sometimes you just have to like mesh everything and use the sort of mesh repair tools, fill hole, fill all holes, that sort of thing to kind of fix it. Um, whereas in this case, I think this one is, whoops, so edges. So this one is actually fixed where the mesh doesn't have any of those seams um, anymore. And generally only happens in these like really surfaces that have huge amount of perforations or huge amount of, you know, um, curved detail, essentially. Okay, so uh, I think those are the fundamental basics, just like mentally, um, those are the steps. Uh, scale to scale your model down first before you consider thicknesses. Intersecting overlapping geometry is okay. Sharing surfaces are okay, as long as you want them to stick together. Barely touching geometry will fall apart. You know, uh, all geometry must be watertight with volume. Use the volume command to check, right? Uh, mesh everything, save at SDL using the binary option. You know, uh, you can use the show edges command to see if there are any naked mesh edges. Uh, fill hole, patch face, these are tools that you can use. Um, this is important uh, at least for very large, you know, sort of site model scale things. Um, to do your scaling as close to the world origin, the zero, zero point as closely as possible. So whenever you're scaling something, move it so that your model is like somewhere around here. Um, because the scaling and everything is much more accurate when you're closer to the zero zero point as opposed to like way out here in space. Um, this will kind of uh, avoid a situation where you get these weird flashing or artifacting surfaces where um, you know the, the sort of curved lines and the surface display do not align. It just like seems they're not, it's like sort of flashing as you're moving it and it's wiggling and all that stuff. I actually don't have a file that replicates that. Um, I see it from time to time, especially on like large scale models that were like maybe urban scale and got scaled down uh, a lot to for 3D printing or laser cutting that happens. Um, so the sort of fix is really to do that. And then sometimes actually you have to re-export or export it into a file that has a very high tolerance uh, setting in its like unit setting. So that's kind of it, more or less. Uh, we'll have a separate video actually talking about the MakerBot in particular, um, but this is the sort of general overview. All right.